welcome for the, um, this um, lecture. We are going to be faithful to what I promised, and that is that we will be very much on the ball of concrete examples. Um, and one book that really would give you a wonderful um, addition to what you get in this course, I want to recommend to you here. That is um, a Perry Link's An Anatomy of Chinese. Now that is a thoroughly entertaining book. And I recommend it with particular joy because it goes about it all uh, quite differently from what we do here. But it's a wonderful book to read. So, um, uh, Perry Link, an anatomy of Chinese pays great attention to the aesthetics of the whole thing, to the rhythms of the language, and to the joys of idiom. <laughs> and I think the system of grammar should not prevent us from uh, looking very carefully at the less systematic aspects of idioms what I call the joys of the um, irregular, if you like. So, in any case, uh, that is my uh, recommendation. Oh, that's a tongue you operate very differently. Yes, from, they do. From idioms and other languages. Of course. Yeah. So now, what I want to say is uh, uh, quite simple. I want to suggest to you that we have no more than three kinds of words in Chinese. So when you see something, it's either going to be N, or V, or P, as sure as hell. <laughs> it is as simple as that. So the simplest grammar of Chinese, I have already finished. Um, you have the Ns, and they have this feature that they are negatable in principle by Fei, is not a. So, oh, okay. horse is a noun because you have to say fei <laughs> fei <laughs> <laughs> You see how? Welcome. So it is fei lü fei It is not fu lü You have it? So, the nouns are defined in terms of their negatability by fei and not in terms of their translatability into English nouns. You have it? So that's quite an important difference. We say something is a noun in Chinese to the extent that a Chinese <coughs> would agree, if he knows the language well, that if you were to negate the thing, you would be negating it with fei. And that has some problems. We will get to them. The second thing that you can have is a monosyllabic verb, V, as in xing. And we do not negate normally xing by saying fei xing. <laughs> but we say pu xing. <laughs> and we say pu xing, and you can see we do not say pu xing. <laughs> and the vowel in pu, in pu xing, <laughs> is mm, not the citation form vowel. And we will insist throughout this course to study carefully these variations. You see, it is pu xing, and pu xing mm -hmm. is very different from pu xing. Um, uh, how do you understand uh, Pu Xing? Pu Xing Ye Xing. No. Pu Xing. Walk by foot. Yes, walk by foot. Pu Xing, walk on foot. Right? So you have Pu Xing, Pu Xing. <laughs> Pu xing, pu xing, is, uh, yes, uh, to walk by foot is not okay. Yeah. 
Um, now, uh, this is not uh, crucial for us, but the point that we want to make is that xing bu xing and not fi xing fei xing. <laughs> right? So, the xing is negated by bu. And the final particle here is not a predicate in the sense that you can't go ahead and try to negate it. If you sit back, a sentence like uh, John likes to swim, all the elements in John likes to swim can be negated. It wasn't John who liked to swim, and so on and so on. John doesn't like to swim, and John likes not to swim. And so on. And so one can negate all sorts of elements in a sentence, and the particles are the ones that cannot be the scope of negation. Do you get it? That cannot be the predicate, cannot be the point to be negated. Hmm? Adverbs can be negated in English, uh, you see, uh, at, uh, with certain restrictions. Adjectives are constantly negated by un, <laughs> and so on and so on. Yes? So I know you said you would get back to it, but I'm interested yeah. to sort of see how this works with fei, because fei tone, yeah. I would consider that a noun. I would consider tone a noun. No. And uh, we will that. go into this. I have uh, uploaded for you my wonderful thesis from 1981, where I collect hundreds of pre-verbal fakes. So, not everything that is negated by fey is a noun, but what can only be negated by fey is, as sure as hell. Do we have it? So, uh, the, uh, the definition says what can only be negated by fei. Okay. So, uh, let us, uh, uh, true to our uh, policy, let us look at an example. San ren xian bi you wo shi yan. Right. Now, this, I swear to you, is part of an educated Chinese speaker's speech today. It's, in fact, enough to say San Ren Xing and everybody will uh, smile. <laughs> you see, it is a kind of Xie Hou mm. in which the second part is understood if you say the first part, right? San Ren Xing Bi Yo Wo Shi Yan Three-person walk, have I teacher Yan exist I <coughs> yet, right, is what you can look up in the dictionary, mechanically, right? And the idea, of course, is most people would say when three people are walking along, necessarily there will be my teacher among them. You you see, among them. And that is possible, but it's also quite possible when walking a trois, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? There is bound to be a teacher for me present. Mm -hmm. This is nice grammar. <laughs> you see, Sanren here, the Sanren can be an NP, San Ren, but used ad the ad verb, right? So, a trois, <laughs> being three persons, right? You get it? So, San Ren is an NP, but it can be NP ad the. Do we have it? That is a possibility, I'm not imposing anything. But I swear to you that some Chinese think that that is how it works, and other Chinese swear that it is simply when three people are walking along there, my teacher is among them. The 
issue doesn't need to, to be <laughs> resolved here now, but it is interesting to see that when some completely unknown people walk along, to say that your teacher is among them is very different from that you, at toi, you see, walk with three people. Hmm? So the issue is quite substantial. Hmm? Quite substantial. Not any old group of three guys, hmm, you see, but any two people with whom I am walking will, and so on. It's the different philosophy. Can you see the grammar is crucial? And I remind you, I am of opinion, that the kind of philology we are here doing is a conditio sine qua non, a necessary condition for any decent research on Chinese matters of any kind. And therefore, we are doing something quite fundamental here. So, that's that. We have now Xing, Sanren, Bu Xing. And you see now this Xing is classical Chinese. You don't say woman Xing, yes, Xing. <laughs> right? So you can see Xing to walk is classical Chinese. But in Xingzhou, you can see modern Chinese uses the classical Chinese. And here we have something which I beg you to note. It will be repeated many times. The syntax of classical Chinese is an integral part of the morphology modern Chinese. An integral part, but a proper part, only part of it. So, for example, Shema is not constructed out of two classical Chinese words. Shema is, in fact, probably alone into Chinese, not from classical, but from some uh, languages that um, very likely were polysyllabic and existed in China before <laughs> the Chinese um, became dominant. That is my idea of Shema. So are there Semitic languages? Or? Uh, well, if it's um, more than monosyllabic, you see, it's probably not Sinitic, you see. And uh, we have quite good reason to believe that many non-Sinitic languages have had an influence on Chinese. Yeah. Witness the Hudia the butterfly, and witness uh, many other words um, in medieval, what we call Wudian Bai Hua. Classical uh, Bai Hua has lots of things that are not constructed out of classical words, but <coughs> the vast majority of modern Chinese words in, uh, are, of course, so constructed. And that is why the best way of <coughs> studying modern Chinese is indeed to uh, learn to construe the meanings of bisyllabic words out of their constituents, which are classical words. And in modern Chinese, of course, would count as morphemes. Sorry, yes? um, is it possible that uh, some words were were actually formed by classical uh, words, but due to sound change, they are not rec recognizable anymore. I don't think so. That I think is uh, is fairly uh, that is fairly rare. But what is true is that lots of people today, do the little morshui pugo. You see, in their stomach, the morshui, um, uh, the ink is not sufficient. That is to say, they don't know enough classical Chinese and won't recognize the classical sources of what they say. So, you know, as somebody who is a specialist in classical Chinese can explain more of modern Chinese um, morphology in terms of classical Chinese than uh, um, an, uh, uh, somebody without that training and extensive reading in classical Chinese, yes. So let's go. Uh, we have now here the San Ren Xiao. Ren was our noun, right? And B, we better learn to explain 
as something. You see, and we can say booby, right? And therefore, it's going to be explained as a verb, but not now. So we have then um, What is qi here? What does qi mean? What? It's a device. So it is as fat a noun as you can hope for. <laughs> you know, it is a very well-defined noun. Qi, the tool. Qi, the vessel. Qi, the utensil. Right? That is qi. And now cometh this thing, which is so important in classical Chinese, that when something is basically a noun, you can have ho yu. You can have lively use of it. <laughs> you can use it as a verb. That doesn't mean it is <laughs> basically a verb, but it does mean it can be used as a verb. Here then, zi what does that mean? Yeah. Well, Jin Zi Ruler, child, not tool. <laughs> right? Now, ruler, child, of course, they tell us now, is a word, Jin And I say that nothing in the classical Chinese language distinguishes between the idiomatic, syntactic form, ruler's child, and the word as uh, one word. So, um, in the last 3,000 years, Chinese philologists have actually not had a notion of the word, and it is only linguists from universities very much like Chicago who have imposed this idea on them, because as linguists they said, any decent language has words. <laughs> Fact is, of course, <laughs> that the Chinese have been studying um, their language uh, 2,900 years longer than people in Chicago. <laughs> and also, uh, you know, uh, 2,000 years uh, longer than speakers of English. <laughs> and they have never needed the notion of a word. That should strike a bell, should make us think. Why can you, or how can you, study a language so intensely <laughs> and never need the notion of a word? How can you be so intelligent, write so many dictionaries, and never want to distinguish between a phrase that is idiomatic and a word? The answer to this is, of course, because Chinese morphology, even in modern Chinese, is homogeneous with ancient Chinese syntax. So the word formation is very much like syntactic formation. So much so that it becomes plausible to say in classical Chinese that all formations that are called words by modern linguists actually are formed like any old syntactic construction. So, my proposal to translation is this. The man of character will not prostitute himself. And that is very much how it is felt in China today. Um, if you are a man of character, not superior character, but if you are Hao Han, <laughs> you know, a decent chap, you see, you will not be made use of by institutions like governments or large corporations or small corporations, but you, your life will be an expression of your how han hood. If you see, so here you can see, Jun Zi Pu Qi. 
uh, if you learn no more uh, from this class, you will have been greatly enriched because it summarizes a spirit of ancient China that I think is very important and which subsists today. Yes? Is that Confucius? That is uh, Confucius. Uh, yeah. okay. Ezra Pound translates that as a proper man is not a dish. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And I have to uh, uh, confess to you that if you ever see any of the, um, uh, if you ever see any of the translations by Ezra Pound, you know, get them. Don't tell anybody you read them, but I tell you, my pleasure in ancient Chinese poetry derives very largely from reading Ezra Pound. I think it is fantastic, but of course it is not literal, and so on. Yes. Sir, I don't exactly understand your. When you said that Jinza is not a word, but it's still, when your translation is still man of character, that's kind of combines ruler and child in a certain way. That yeah, uh, uh, like so you, yes, Lord. I understand your question very well, you know. <clears throat> Since I translate it as man of character, why don't I admit that it's very much like gentleman, one word? Hmm? Mm -hmm. My answer is that you must distinguish between two things here. One is, how is it to be analyzed in classical Chinese terms? Right? The analysis in classical Chinese terms is jun zhi zi. You see? So, the zi of a jun, right? And then you can have all sorts of semantic um, annotations to that. <laughs> but that is how it works, right? So it is n ad n, right? Jun is n ad n like a baseball player, and so on. So Junzi here is uh, simply a genitive. Jun um, So you can see, uh, your question actually is very useful. Don't confuse our translations with syntactic theoretical analyses. Right? Our analyses, or mine in any case, they aspire to reconstruct how you would see it from the inside, right? And try to avoid to impose structures that we know very well from general linguistics anyway. In fact, I think it is wise from a language so well studied and so well documented to ask not only how can we subsume it under the theories we have, we might also want to ask, what is it we can learn from this language that we didn't know before? See? So um, I find, for example, if really I wanted to just subsume um, uh, Chinese under um, the theories we have, you know, then I would like to do something else instead. If you, I, mean, you know, I have better things to do than just to subsume and say, yes, it's as we expect. You know, that's not the exciting thing. The exciting thing for me is to see what we can learn here that we wouldn't necessarily have learned from studying um, uh, English or indeed um, Malay or whatever. So we have, when I say will not prostitute himself, you see, is Puchi will refuse to be a dish. Mm. Exactly. So that was the verb qi, which is a derived verb. So we say it works like a verb and isn't therefore primarily and basically one. Hmm? That's why we call this use of qi a huo yung. And when huo yung becomes sufficiently habitual, the huo yung becomes one of the yung fa. And it is quite difficult to say exactly when that happens. Yes? So are we proposing that this T mm. is different from T in, in, in context like, um, so like, uh, mm. right? Mm. Are we going to say that those are two different T? Yes. Because 不成器, you say 不打, that is not an old Chinese word. That is. Udian by Hua, Buddha. Bu Cheng, you do not become a Qi, a decent Chan. 
that you can see qi, you see, is uh, liao bu qi. <laughs> Hufeng qi. Hufeng qi is you don't become liao bu qi. Qi. Very interesting. So it is, uh, it is uh, the same word, you see, but used here in a totally different way. Because right. here the qi is subservient tool for the use of others, you see, which prostitutes itself, is even glad to be just used, you see, to be, as by the way, Li Guan Yu says, you know, said to me, you are a digit of Singaporean society. You see. Oh, that is qi. <laughs> you see, and, uh, you know, we don't like it. But and you your qi, Butang qi, is indeed the kind of useful person you know, of achievement, you know. For example, even Li Bo would be called a qi in that sense, yeah. because you really made it. See, to cheng qi is to make it. It's my uh, <laughs> interpretation of uh, Butang qi. Mm. Then why would qi, in one sense, mean to make yourself a poor, and the other sense, to make yourself a useful? Isn't that interesting, you see? And we are into something very fundamental here. It is the constraints imposed by the context, you see? So here, junzi, bu qi, that qi is very clearly something that a junzi wouldn't want to do, <laughs> right? Right. And, and uh, you see, and that is how these are read, but that is also how English is read, you know, and Shakespeare is understood, frankly. Uh, you know, it is um, very typical for Shakespeare that he would, you know, use words in meanings that are created by the context for that word, interestingly and poetically. And this is a very lively way of talking. It is, of course, my humble opinion that people in the Analects were incredibly lively and that you have to read it very much like reading Shakespeare. You have to dramatize each piece. You see? And understand, for example, that Junzi here is not going to be a person of decent background, you see, coming from uh, a Jun. You see? So it's not going to be um, a person of gentleman status. Right? The people of gentleman status, in the eyes of this discourse are xiao ren, you know, are slight little men, <laughs> little, <laughs> little men, right? Can you see that? So, a junzi in the sense of a person of high status would, in Confucius's eyes, be very <coughs> often described as a xiao ren, a little man. So that's the complication. And then, by the way, and see. You can then say, and why is it that in other contexts we do understand Junz as a person of the upper class? And I can only answer in the same way, you see, because you read the text from the field of expectations that is created by the context. Right? That is what you have to do. And you have to do more of that in Chinese than you do in Russian or in Greek. And that is why, because the Chinese is so much more underdetermined. We will talk more about it later. So, shall we say that is it? We have Junzi Bu Qi. I think it is memorable. You won't have come in vain <laughs> if you remember no more. Right? And then we have this thing which is equally. <laughs> Interesting. Of course, uh, can you read it for me and see? <laughs> yes. And you can see that she sees Yu and she knows it's Wu. <laughs> you see? And you can see that this is interesting for us. You have Wu Hu Ai Zai. You have a beautiful tonal harmony with double rhyming and so on. It's all very nice. And you have a zai, which is a particle zai, right? And that particle is post-verbal. 
I, you have it? So it is a P post V. Can you get that? It's a P post V. So it's a particle. And you couldn't say, woo hoo I, put I. <laughs> you see? And nor can you say, woo hoo I, faint I. <laughs> it's completely, in, uh, you know, you just couldn't do it. So here we have um, a Zai, which is a particle, unnegatable, uh, exclamatory, and it adds to the meaning of what precedes, so it is post-add, uh, an I. So, alas and alack, Note the sustained level of uh, uh, sustained level tone harmony of the rhyming phrase. I would love to show you how this is very common in ancient Chinese literature. When they get very um, emotional, then they love to have tonal harmony. Where you have I da bu hu ba da da, you see this kind of thing, and that's very common and in very early uh, Chinese literature already. So you have this wu hu ai zai, you have um, one of the many, many examples where classical Chinese is deliberately euphonic. Euphonic comes from ei, good, well, and phonain, phone, phonetic, <laughs> the sound, right, voice, euphonic. So, the principles of euphony are terribly important for Chinese grammar. You will see that. Rhythmic euphony is crucial, as we shall see. You, uh, it's very ugly to, um, for example, to add a monosyllabic adjective to a bisyllabic noun, and so on and so on. And so much so that you, you find it ungrammatical at times. You will see that. You will see that later. So we have wu hu ai zai. Zai is a simplex P post at V, right? We discussed that. And U Hu is a complex particle PP, cannot be denied. You cannot see it. Tabu U Hu, or Wabu U Hu, you see. And it is a predicative U Hu, like Zao Gao. But Zao Wan Jian Bu Zao Gao, Zao Bu Zao Gao. Zao Gao is emphatic, but not like. Uhu, you get it? But of course, Zago uh, also rhyming and so on. Um, note that you do have Ouyan, Chu, Jin, Ji, Zheng, Zhang, Guan, Jin, Bing, Bu, Zago. I just wanted to make sure you can. So <coughs> it's not just me. I found it on the web. Never mind, you can negate. You might think you can't, you know? I mean, because, oh, zao gao, zao gao le. Yeah. You cannot say, bu zao gao le. Yeah. You know, cannot. So there's a problem here, you know? Zao gao has two meanings, you see? One is, this is a shambles, and the other is, da. See, this da is uh, unnegatable. <laughs> so you get it? You see? So you have, in fact, in my view, you have two, uh, two, um, <laughs> in cases of uh, Zao Gao. Mm -hmm. So, as I understood the etymology of Zao Gao, mm -hmm. that had some sort of connotation of like a dregs yeah. cake, a cake made of dregs. Yeah. But in this case, it looks like you can only negate it with Fu. So are we saying that this is... No, 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 no. Uh, you, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> So you can see there is no need for you to say here, you know, that you need a pu for that zao gao to be predicate. But even with the modifiers that we're using here, yeah. ha, ta, dia, yeah, yeah. Chan, all yeah. these other things, along, this would give us the impression that zao gao is functioning either as an adjective or predicate. As a predicate, yes. So do we want to say that there's been some sort of grammaticalization of this? Uh, no, I would, uh, I would, you can say yes. Because the, etymologically, the, it would be now. Uh, the meaning, that of Zao Gao, uh, Zao Gao Luo, actually. Uh, you see, that meaning is a case of Xu Hua, emptification in Chinese, uh, grammaticalization, yes. 
So you, um, so basically, you know, Zhaogao is in fact a nominal predicate. Zhaogao, and that's why it's so interesting that you're going to have a look afterwards. Zhaogao. Mm. So, basically, by the way, all wine in ancient China is beer, and the Zhaogao are the dregs of beer making. Yeah. <laughs> It is true that, uh, you know, Pu Tao is uh, quite late. And of course, it was pretty rotten in, even in the, the 80s still, the Chinese Pu Tao Jiao, the Chinese uh, wine made from uh, in vineyards, you know, was pretty grim. Chang Chang, <laughs> pretty grim, I think. You know. It was a threat when you were offered it. <laughs> Enough. This is not grammar. Let's go on. Um, what I want to uh, explain on this occasion is the primacy of um, the pronunciation of characters. So, for example, wuhu can be written yuhu, yuhu, wuhu, 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 and so on and so on. And a comprehensive list of such allographs was produced by a, a person that I admire immensely, Zhu Qifeng, his comprehensive treatise on phrases, the Ci Tong. If you ever see a copy of that, buy it. It's an orgy of description of this phenomenon, you see, that in many cases the Chinese are systematically indifferent to how to write things. Right? So, Buhu, you know, they really don't care. And they don't. Um, for example, to wriggle, way, you know, to wriggle, 57 ways of writing to wriggle, and they don't care. And uh, uh, this man, uh, Zhu Qifeng, has produced a beautiful, fat two volume edition listing up all these cases, you see, which show that those people who, like Leibniz at some stage in his life, <coughs> thought that the character somehow are essentially linked to the meaning and not the pronunciation. They have it desperately wrong, right? The characters in Chinese are quietly writing words. And it's in some interesting, exceptional circumstances that the shape of characters has direct meaning. So you can see here, in any case, a fat book listing all the cases where the same word, the same pronunciation can be read, can be uh, written out in many, many ways. So, shall we say, that is it. We now know that in Chinese we are going to expect any syllable to be of these three types. And we will not recognize any other types. That is the grammar. So, as you probably recognize, I've got a task on my hands explaining where have all the adverbs gone, <laughs> you see, and so on, right? So, I better have a song, <laughs> you see, and it will come, but not quite now. Let's wait for it, you see, but clearly I have a task to show where all the adverbs and the adjectives and the number words and so on, yeah, you know. So. Let us look first at the complex. Complex nominal is Junzi. It is a complex. It is an NP. So you can see now, I am hard-nosed. I am not interested in what modern linguists, including also my very dear friend Jim McCauley, who thought I needed to impose the notion of words. Yeah? <laughs> but actually was, in the process of discussing these things, converted. The thing is, you would tend to want to say, look, you know, this is a tight unit, you know. Let's call it a word, you see. Makes no, there's no need to do that, you see. You just say it is an NP because it consists of more than one N, thank you very much, and the head is an N, therefore the whole thing is an NP, thank you. You see? That's all. So it's very straightforward logic here. You see? When the thing is complex, we call it complex NP. That's all. Do these NPs have layers? 
construction? Oh, yes, you will see. Okay. Yes, we will see lots of that. So, we have VPs. So, for example, when somebody... Can you read this? So, the VP is interesting because you can see that when how, which does not mean good in classical Chinese, but means uh, beautiful, handsome, how to, <laughs> and so on. So, how uh, is to be prone to and to like, you see, to have a penchant for, <laughs> you know. And so you have how <coughs> here, and that is how always vt. It's rigidly with an object, and here that object is in fact sure. And now cometh an interesting issue. Ta how sure. The sure. Is that nominal or is that verbal? Right? So, uh, we want to say how sure is love study. But is study there a verb or a noun? How would you argue for it? Tricky question. Uh, most people would insist, like myself, it is verbal, but I insist that we justify our common view, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Yes, indeed, we would all agree, you see, but one would like to know by what criterion, Piaojun, we actually decide that uh, Xue is a verb here. This is what we want to do in the course of our lectures, to learn to dis define such criteria. For example, if how has lots of other um, uh, objects of this kind that are very rare as nouns, then we have a good argument. Do you see what I mean? So, uh, but we have uh, how se. What is how se? No, 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 no. To be fond of the ladies. <laughs> I mean, it's, it is, uh, you know, it is how. Yes, yes, it's to be fond of makeup, is the literary so, right? How so is to be fond of the ladies. Um, and so, since we have that, the question is do we need to understand how so along the lines of how so? Or along the lines of uh, uh, how you you to like to swim? Wouldn't it just be easier to theorize if it's an incorporate element? Well, um, I don't know what how, how that would help. What we here now need to answer is a very sort of you know beginner's question. You know, is this like how sir, or is it like how you you? You see, or um, and that's a, quite a, a, you know, a it's a simple question. What? It's how you you as well for me. Okay. Well, how you certainly, yeah, you know, yeah, and so on. Yeah. 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 How you is where it's only in order to where that everybody understands, you know, to swim. But you would, of course, use just how you. Mm. Uh, by the way, if you now want to look for examples of how with a verbal object, you would probably find 240 of them in uh, this thesaurus linguae sericae, um, because that is what this is all about. It would tell you that there are, of course, hundreds of them. So we could then have a look. And then, of course, also take a critical view and ask ourselves, are the ones that are taken to be verbal demonstrably verbal? Right? What are the criteria by which we have found that the case? So, then we have PP, you see, which is uh, uh, Uhu Alas. So, can you see now, in fact, 
we've just said, when you see a character, basically, it's either a noun or a verb or a particle. And I now say, when you see a construction, it's either a noun or a verb or a particle, either a VP or an NP or a PP. And there is, you see, where have all the sentences gone? You see, for example. What do I have to say on that? Do you get it? I better explain. And of course, the explanation is very much that a sentence that has a verbal head is a VP, and a sentence that has a nominal head, like Zhegetung Si San Kwai Tian, is an NP, <laughs> and that the notion of the sentence is actually a pragmatic notion of how something functions, but it's not a syntactic function, uh, a notion. Um, in the sense of um, us requiring to deny that something that has a verbal head therefore isn't verbal, which is what you have to do when you say that a verbal sentence is a sentence, you see, in theory. That is a very bad theory because the head of it is verbal and you say it isn't a VP, that is incoherent. Of course, many syntactic theories today agree with us on this and would say <laughs> that the top note in, uh, that, that Chomsky used to call an S should be a VP. Absolutely. So we now know single characters are Vs, Ns, or Ps, and anything else are VPs, NPs, <laughs> or PPs. Right? And we better give an idea of what that grammar would look like. Is that okay? Yes? Um, where would Bo itself fit into the schema? Would it uh, be P. Particle? Okay. And La? Because, by the way, because when it is, uh, mm -hmm. when it is preceded by Fe, right? Then this Fe is, it isn't as if, and it negates not the Bu, but the whole Bu phrase. So this becomes quite complicated. Yeah. And then love would also be under PP? Le uh, is P post at uh, S. If, uh, yes, post at S. Okay. Mm. Good. So now, what would the grammar look like? Here it is. We have the nominals, and among these, the count nouns, the mass nouns, the collective mass nouns, and so on, the collective um, nouns, the abstract nouns, the pro nouns. Um, the ad nominal nouns, the adverbial nouns, and the NPs of the same kinds of structures. So this is the basic history of nominal things, right? So let's look first at the NC. So when you say san ren xing, then what you're saying is on one reading, three persons walk. What you are counting are individuals. Mm -hmm. When you say san min, what does that mean? Ren min de min, san min. San min would be three classes of people, you know, mm -hmm. the shang, yeah, the ping, the ping, the guan. Uh, and so on. So, min is nm. It's a mass noun in the sense that it's counted by the kind. It is, in fact, it works like sanjo. What would sanjo be? Wine. Three kinds of wine, you see? Yeah. And sanjo cannot be three bottles of wine and so on. So, we decide here and now that all the grammars that you have uh, seen of uh, classical Chinese are rotten because they don't make these distinctions, which are absolutely central for any understanding of what's going on in the language. So what we say is that you are either a count noun or a mass noun, or you can be a collective noun and you will see how that works. Then how do you decide that something is an abstract noun?
Yeah. So um, we better now decide that it's not going to be because we translate it into an English abstract noun. Can all these are yes. all these are more or syntactically defined, so I'm not yeah. quite sure how they to are. distinguish they them are. abstract nouns. They are, right. So the count nouns are the ones that are counted in this way uh, right. by... These would, get class yeah. these would get classifiers, mass Yes, and so on. There. And so now the, uh, uh, the uh, criteria for an abstract noun, we can, just uh, to give you an idea of the database, what it does, we can go out of the system and we can uh, go into the database and we can go into uh, the uh, syntactic categories and we can go into the uh, an app and then you can see that we have um, in all 2811 abstract nouns and we have 200 and and we have 19 subtypes of abstract nouns so you will have enough to learn <laughs> during this term on nouns, right? All this you have. And then you have here uh, the books on abstraction. So for example, um, histoire et, uh, Les Noms Abstraits, Histoire et Théorie, very interesting book. But you can also, you can also go back um, and look at, um, uh, for example, uh, Mulsberger, very interesting, uh, abstract expression in Old Latin, uh, form and dramatic function of abstract um, uh, discourse uh, in the uh, ancient dramatic literature. Note, we are looking for a way of looking, putting the Chinese phenomena in a comparative uh, context in all sorts of languages. And now comes the thing that you are asking for. What are the criteria? Here they are. Cannot be counted with classifiers and can be counted, if at all, not by physical items. That's clear. Hmm? So, <coughs> two, cannot be quantified by universal existential or graded quantifiers. You cannot have, you know, all, some, and so on, uh, operating on an abstract noun. Uh, the object designated by the N cannot be said to move in space, and so on. So we can give more. Um, so yeah. purge would then not be an abstract noun in Chinese, right? If you, you can have some purge in English. Yeah. You can have all the courage you need for it yes. or, or whatever. But, but uh, in Chinese, then, because you cannot use these So, uh, uh, So it's a good question, you know. Can we, can we say that s these criteria would apply to English? Answer is no. Mm -hmm. Can we, on the other hand, say that, um, for example, all the courage uh, works like all courages, you see? Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the type of quantification here is quite complicated also in English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Courage is not normally uh, something that you can, uh, that you can uh, uh, see when you have, uh, you can say all courage must presuppose and so on and so on, you see? Mm -hmm. Then you have something which <coughs> never have in Chinese, and that is the point, mm -hmm. right? Which we never have in Chinese. Right? So, and of course, we would be delighted if we found counterexamples, you see? But we have not found uh, some, all, and so on, the words for this to quantify directly over abstract nouns in Chinese. So which quantifiers do we generally use as the diagnosis for Jie, zhou, bian, and so on. Xi. No, no, we, we are talking now mainly in classical Chinese, yes. Okay, so these are all defined on classical Yes, in the okay. first instance for classical Chinese. 
So we have so we have about if you look if you are interested we could look now just for fun uh, into uh, our synonym groups and we can look at all and then you can see we have uh, seven main words for all right and then we have a great many mo uh, more um, 89 words that function in, under the general heading of all in Chinese. And this you can all look up um, in the database. I don't think we should now go too deeply into it, but none of these then are supposed to uh, uh, be able to quantify over. So, mm. so you cannot say yi qie yi, yi qie dao. Or jie, or jin, and so on, for uh, for, for abstract nouns. So, I hope this was uh, gave you some idea of how this hangs together. The things that I'm discussing here can be illustrated in great detail um, in the database that I'm just showing you, and you can see. Uh, that this will, in the long run, be something you, you might want to do online as you wonder about things yourself. So, it would be very useful if I could find now um, the... here it is. So, slideshow here we go. So you have, we, we are now, I suppose, satisfied that old Christoph is, con, uh, is has condemned himself to syntact syntactically define the difference between mass nouns, count nouns, abstract nouns, pronouns. Pronouns, by the way, being defined by the fact that when they function as objects, they can be preposed. We, uh, zhi, and so on, um, and so on. And so now, that would be the general peaceful outline in the first instance of the grammar of uh, nouns. Second part, grammar of the verbal. So you have the intransitive ones that have a subject but don't have an object. Uh, the transitive ones that have a subject but don't have but and do have an object. And the ditransitive ones that have two objects and the subjectless verbs, of which we have a furious number in Chinese, which can be intransitive and their subjectlessness can be of three types. One, that they logically don't have a subject like it is raining. The other, that they are, uh, that they have a um, an omitted subject which is lexically predictable. So if I say no in Chinese, that is I agree. Right? So the I, the subject, is lexically predictable. You don't need to look at the context. It's in the grammar. And then, of course, we have uh, lots and lots of uses of um, the verbs that have um, understood um, subjects from context, and so on. Then you have, of course, the de-verbal adjectives like zo, ma, where zo still is. What does zo mean? Run. So, Zoma would be a running horse. So we have Zoma, Kanhua, uh, right? And some people would say that a running horse is looking at flowers. I don't think it is. <laughs> so, what is Zoma, uh, Kanhua? When I'm riding a running horse, I uh, look at flowers. Literally. So, um, running horse modality-wise, you see, 
to speak like a linguist, you see, running horse modality wise to look at. Uh, so you can see, zoma is not the subject, but actually, zoma is adverbial. It's an NP <coughs> ad VP. Do you have it? It's an NP which modifies a VP. Zoma, carwa. Interesting. And of course, very poetic. So it is. So to run, <coughs> running horse, look at flowers. Um, we say very often also, zoma sheng yi, not wang wen sheng yi, but zoma sheng yi, on horseback to create meanings of words and phrases uh, arbitrarily. That is a joke. It's not regular in Chinese. So you have it. That is the uh, adjectives. And then you have the uh, V ad V. What does that mean? Of course, Kwai Zhou, and so on. Right? Kwai is the verb, and it can be used adverbially. Hmm? So uh, uh, the de-verbal adverbs are in the hundreds. They are simply verbs in Chinese that can function before other verbs as adverbs. And then we have post-verbal verbals. Um, and we have complex verbals of all these types. So what is a post-verbal? For example, kan hao, xue hao, hao. Ting dao. Ting dao. Kan hao. You see? And we deny that this is anything other. Dao and uh, hao, you see, are still verbs, negatable and so on. But they are the post-ad, another verbal expression. So. Um, can you see that we have now, in very short time, got a pretty good view of generally how Chinese grammar works, you know, by and large. <laughs> it's you know, not in, by any means in all details, but you've got a rough idea that you have a lot of sub-classifications of verbs, nouns, and now we come to the part. Yes. I'm sorry, can you go over one more time? <clears throat> the, the difference between the round brackets and the square brackets and the um, listing. We will study this in uh, greater detail in, uh, w when we come to it, but I can repeat it now. Yeah. The square brackets indicate that there is an element that is omitted and that is recoverable in an ideal dictionary, which a dictionary should identify. Of course, our dictionaries are so stupid, they translate no as yes. Well, if you're so stupid, you know, you will understand nothing. Because, of course, no is I agree, right? So we need to think of an ideal dictionary, right, which would say that in no, the subject is always absent, and it's always the first person, uh, the speaker. So let us take another example. Run, bu run, run. Right? If I say run, what does that mean? It is so. Right? It is so. And there you can see your blossoming round bracket. Because what is so, you don't look up in the dictionary. Do you get it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the third one is yu, where there is no logical subject, right? Which, which a professor, my teacher in philosophy, Peter Strawson would call a feature-placing a piece of feature-placing predicate, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. We now have these brackets basically taped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, you can still argue where a certain thing belongs, and that can be difficult, but the basic principles, I don't think, are very controversial. Does it or doesn't it? deserve to be in an ideal dictionary. Can it be there? 
then it is the square bracket. Mm -hmm. Does it depend on the concrete contact as in run? You see, then it is round brackets. And is there no subject to speak of logically? Then it is zero without brackets. And what they're saying basically is we are conducting here in the good Polish logical tradition of Idukiewicz and Wukasiewicz <laughs> and Wisniewski and so on, you see, uh, categorical grammar. Mm -hmm. You see, <laughs> we, we, we reduce this to logic. And in fact, I can um, assure you that um, medieval logicians in Europe uh, have widely used this tripartite division of word classes. The logicians have always seen it this way. So it's not my original contribution by any, <laughs> by any means. Hmm? So we have a lot of open questions still to be answered. But let us look at the particles first. So you have the abnominal particles, as in Zhuho, the <coughs> various lords, for example. Hmm? You have the ad sentential particles, as in, for example, uh, the sentence initial particles like Fu and so on. Uh, you have the adverbial particles, and you have the post-nominal particles, and the post-sentential particles like ye, yeah, and the post-verbial particles, and the complex particles. By this time, I think, you, you know, you really kind of sit back and say, well, perhaps this is enough, <laughs> if you see what I mean, you know. It is already quite a, a grammar that is a great deal more sophisticated than what you uh, see published in English. Mm, as far as I know. Uh, but, as you probably may have noticed, uh, in fact, the categorical system that I am introducing to you has more than 1,000 such, ca uh, such categories. And you will see why. <laughs> we need them. Yes? Sorry, does it yeah. add and post? That means it comes before and after? After, yes. And when it comes before, it is typically modifies and precedes, you see, add. And when it comes after, it is post add, you see, comes after and modifies. And we do have that. How jila, for example, jila is, uh, is um, uh, VP, jila, uh, VP post add V, right? Comes after and modifies. So you do get this effect that something modifies. Um, something that precedes it in Chinese. Hmm? But of course the rule is on the contrary, that uh, you uh, modify what, um, uh, what you precede. Yeah? Uh, by adverbial particles you don't mean adverb. Okay. Um, well, we will see, you will see that to me an adverb, this school category consists of Kind, three kinds, the P at V's, the V at V's, the N at V's, and the NP at V's, and the VP at V's, and the PP at V's. So you can see, to me, you see, you have to be specific here. Adverb is not a, uh, is not a kosher category, um, because it is, in fact, it can be made superfluous, and in the spirit of William of Ockham, who studied in the same college that I did in Oxford, in Merton, <laughs> he had Occam's razor. And he thought that you have made progress in linguistics, as in any other science, if you have explained a concept that was there in terms of other concepts that you need anyway. You see? So this simplification is of the essence of understanding. And so I, to me, of course, I have to Admit, I think that it is a very fine effort that I will show you in a minute, or perhaps a little more than a minute. Uh, I will show you that we can uh, explain all your traditional word classes in terms of these three, and that I consider to be progress in linguistics. So, let us now look at an example. Yes. 
is let us look at an example here. Now that has to be read like I do read it, right? You cannot say and you cannot read it like this is no good. You can see people are telling us a lie when they think that you can scan this anyway. You see, it's very obligatory, it is very clear. No Chinese would read it any other way than hmm? So, that's what it is. Use, achieve pattern, excellent, flourish talent. Right? So, what this is, is it shows that you have a structure that is non-binary. You have seven things that are... Um, but, uh, in any Chinese traditional vision of this, structural vision of this, you have it with a break after year. For example, when they ask me, uh, what do you study? Then I would say, <laughs> that is a phrase, huh? um, which is self-contained. Hmm? And now you have these particles if you are one, you someone uses them, gets to use them, so as to to make a satisfactory pattern. How Xiu Cai? He is a good PhD. <laughs> <laughs> I quote this, of course, because you don't think so, and of course, uh, sinologists generally don't agree with me. I think it's perfectly true. Is my humble opinion. You, know, you don't sort out your particles, you see. You are not going to read Chinese very well. So, uh, in traditional China, that was the view, you see. If you can... What is the scandal here? The scandal is that is what? NP or VP? is the head. I think it's used as a verb, like a verb. Ah, yeah. Fei yeah. It would be fei. So, what we have here, and what you are reluctant to uh, diagnose, is a noun phrase that is predicative, uh, very much like uh, like uh, okay. yeah. it's a, So, what we say, it is an NP that works predicative. You have it? It's a predicative NP here. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Uh, yes. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, does the preverbial uh, a, a constitute a particle? Uh, yes, it's a uh, we will see. We will see. It's a particle. Cannot be negated. Yeah. It's a real stinker, of course. <laughs> we will get to it. So now it says Gu Yen. Yeah. The <coughs> old proverb says, right? Do proverbs <coughs> speak? <coughs> no, they don't. So uh, you can see here that yeah actually does not mean say here in any strict sense. It's just that the English say is as ambiguous as the Chinese say. The proverb does not speak. You see? But it runs as follows. So, ye is actually run. <laughs> Not in the sense of zhou, <laughs> but you know, run as follows. That's very often the case. Hmm? So you have to be very careful. This 
以知乎者也,以言哉, is in fact a gu yen, which runs like this. And it therefore describes something that is uh, held important in ancient Chinese culture. So, you can see here the, um, uh, these marks, punctuation marks. And for what now remains of the class, I want to say a few things about punctuation. Why? There's a book called Pause and Effect. That book explains beautifully how Punctuation is one indigenous way of parsing by indigenous people of their own language. So it's very precious. When they put a comma here or a mark there, it's very interesting because it shows that they clearly had conceptualized through this marking and mark some structural features. Now that's very important. So I will give you some examples. This mark, for example, we don't have in Greek. Modern editions don't give it for Greek. Um, we don't have it in English. We don't have it in any other language that I know except Japanese. Right? Because it marks a kind of coordination of a very special kind, the list coordination among nominals. Hmm? And it's very interesting to see the history of this Biaudien. So, we have this book, which I don't have as a PDF, actually. I don't think it exists. It's a very beautiful book. It's the history of the development of Chinese punctuation marks by Guan Xihua, which you can get as a PDF. It is very good. It tells you the story of Zhongguo Gu Dai. Biao Dian Fu Hao Fa Zhan Shi. That's a very good book for your purposes. And you also have this Yuan Hui Biao Dian Fu Hao Ci Dian, excellent survey of the immense complications. Um, and you have Liu Xinfang, Zhang Guo Jian Du Bo Shu Biao Dian Fu Hao Shi Li, which is a nice survey of examples of excavated literature, you see, where excavated texts would put regular um, punctuation marks and thus show us how they parsed their texts. These are precious things to study. And I'm reminding you, last time we were talking uh, about um, uh, this specialist, um, uh, Sun Yamin from uh, Shandong, who wrote on the traditional way the Chinese had of analyzing syntactically. This is another part of the same story. Um, we have a way of, to, of looking at the Chinese themselves parsing and analyzing their own sentence. That's fascinating. So, uh, it will amuse you that Nicanor the punctuator, Stigmatias, who flourished under the Roman Emperor Hadrian. He had a system of no less than eight marks of punctuation which he marked the text, with which he marked the text of the Iliad. And three forms of the full stop, two of the colon, and three of the comma. Isn't that fascinating? And he was a Stoic, and as you know, the linguistics in ancient uh, Greece and Rome were very importantly moved forward by the Stoic philosophers. So, I hope you don't mind <laughs> me drawing your attention to this. You do have this also. See? And you have the whole of the Iliad then punctuated by somebody according to these principles. 
we have in the text? Uh, I don't think it's complete at all, but he's um, but he's quoted extensively in the ancient, um, uh, in the you know early commentary editions. Yeah, With quoted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But only you know on occasion. Uh, you would read up on this, of course, in Pauli's Encyclopédie der Altertumswissenschaften, 96 volumes, <laughs> under Nicanor Stigmatias. <laughs> you will learn more than you ever wanted to know about Nicanor. Uh, he was a contemporary of Didymus, who was called the Brazen Stomached, and who um, is, became very famous for writing so many books that he did actually write one book twice. He had forgotten. <laughs> he wrote in all 3,000 books, and that was too much. And uh, Didymus, the brazen stomached, was a colleague of uh, Nicanor, as far as I remember. So um, I hope you enjoy this idea, you see, that uh, in Greece you can have this, in, um, in uh, China you have a long tradition um, of punctuation of texts. Um, some of the biggest uh, encyclopedias ever made in China are completely um, punctuated throughout uh, in um, and, uh, in Yuan times. We then have this very interesting uh, Japanese kairiten which is also a way of, of, of punctuation. <coughs> and you see, when you have they would write it like this, right? And to interpret this, the word yo existed. You see? Marked with shita, bottom, is shifted to the location by, marked by shan, right? and so on. So that, I can now show you the upshot of it. Basically, oops, basically we have Chulun Yo Tun Yu Mao which for them is read as Chulun Tun Mao Yu Yu Zhe Arimas. This I think is very nice, and, <laughs> and uh, I was planning to uh, do for you, um, uh, uh, to show you um, a book of Chinese jokes that is completely uh, annotated in this way. The famous, uh, the famous Xiao Fu um, by Feng Menglong. And so, to end with where I began, namely with Perry Link, I would like to show you an article he wrote in this week's this week's um, New York Review of Books. And he says here, as you can uh, see, uh, perhaps the most anguishing question I get is, Professor Link, what is the Chinese word for X, X, X. I'm always tempted to say the question makes no sense. Anyone who knows two languages moderately well knows that it is rare for words to match up perfectly. And for languages, as far apart as Chinese and English, in which even grammatical categories are conceived differently, strict equivalence is not possible. Book is not shu, because shu, like all Chinese nouns, is conceived as an abstraction, more like bookness. And to say a book, you have to say one volume of bookness. Moreover, shu, but not book, can mean writing, letter, or calligraphy, and so on. So this is uh, the uh, grammatical uh, philosophy of, um, uh, of uh, Perry Link, very amusing, I think. Um, and he goes on, 
I tell my students that there are only two kinds of words they can safely regard as equivalents. Words for numbers, excepting integers under five, the words for which have too many other uses, and words that are invented expressly for the purpose of surviving or serving as equivalents, like sindentu, <laughs> electrocardiogram. I tell them their goal in Chinese class should be to set aside English and get started with thinking in Chinese. This last conclusion I am deeply in sympathy with, but the rest, of course, I think one might want to uh, think uh, critically of. And uh, so I will give you an example of that will show this. Si shu wu jing are, of course, not four kinds of book hood. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, f um, in fact, what is so interesting about si shu is that it's not four books. What is it? Si shu wu jing is not four books. Not any old four books. The four, the four books, you see. So you can see, and it's not the four bookhoods or booknesses. You can see in classical Chinese, then, we do have occasions where, in spite of the absence of the article, that article is absolutely understood by every competent speaker of Chinese. In other words, the absence of a marked definiteness, the absence of a marker for definiteness, like the definite article, proves nothing on the absence or presence of the cognitive category of definiteness in the language. On this thought, we will end, and we will continue with our study of Shu uh, next week, I hope. You enjoyed this, <laughs> and that we can then uh, get more deeply into the final details of grammar that we have now only adumbrated. Do we know what adumbrate is? To shadow. What? Foreshadow. To foreshadow. I, I like the word adumbrate. <laughs> I have not. I like foreshadow. Yes. <laughs> foreshadowed, you know, I think it's really, uh, you know, darkly hinted at. You know, Adam Brighton, yes. So, uh, <coughs> see you next week. It was a pleasure.